Is this the Hollis Company expose we've all been waiting for? Mm, kind of? <laughs> Under the Influence is the fictional story about a woman who takes a job working for a famous hashtag girl boss influencer and finds out it's not all sunshine and social media likes. The book's author, Noelle Crooks, was apparently in charge of the Rise conferences and products at the Hollis Company, that is, before everything fell apart. And according to the New York Times, Noelle was one of 30 people who were laid off in July of 2020. And that is very interesting because the Hollis Company received almost $1 million in PPP loans. So I guess sometimes you just can't choose employment. Am I right? Spare change, ma'am. While Rachel Hollis was facing major public backlash for this now infamous moment, I was doing a live stream and I mentioned that there's a sweet woman who comes to my house twice a week and cleans. She cleans the toilets. Someone commented and said, you are privileged AF. And then she said, well, you're unrelatable. Most people won't work this hard. Most people won't get up at 4 a.m. Literally every woman I admire in history was unrelatable. Your girl is a bougie, bougie bitch. Noelle told the New York Times that she was gonna write a Roman clay book about her experience at the Hollis Company, AKA Hoco, as it's sometimes referred to. Side note, I did not know what a Roman clay book was before making this video, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right, so I apologize. But according to Google, it's a novel in which real people or events appear with invented names. The book was originally supposed to be titled My Life with the Mogul, and I wonder who she could be talking about. <laughs> and that book title really doesn't leave a lot of room for interpretation, so I'm assuming that's why she changed it. And I wanna speculate for a second, this is just my own opinion, that Noelle may have received some sort of cease and desist or a threat of legal action from the Hollises about writing this novel. And we'll talk about some of the drama surrounding the launch of this book towards the end of this video. And I will say in promotions of this book in some of the interviews that I've watched, Noelle now keeps a very tight lip about her inspiration for this story. Is this a Roman Clay? Is that Rachel Hollis? Well, the stories are really such a compilation. Which I find interesting to say the least. So spoiler alerts ahead. Do not go any further if you do not want spoilers. I'm not gonna focus too heavily on all of the love stories and the plot points and the character arcs and all that sort of thing. I'm just gonna focus mostly on what I think was going on at the Hollis Company and how this book's fictional interpretation may be coming through in the pages. So the story follows a 20 something year old Harper Cruz who is a wannabe writer living in New York City. She's sort of down on her luck. She struggles to pay her Ren, she's got a roommate who's kind of has it all and she looks up to her, but in her position, she's working kind of a dead end job and no prospects in sight. I'm pretty sure that Harper is based on Noelle. That seems to make the most sense. So Harper, while looking for jobs online, comes across a position for a visionary support strategist at a company called Greenhouse. Greenhouse, I believe, is AKA the Hollis Company. The description of Greenhouse entails mandatory dance parties, kumbaya type style meetings, and also constant social media content capturing around the office. To me, that sounds pretty similar to what I experienced watching the content from the Hollis Company. So Greenhouse is based in Nashville, Tennessee, and Hoco was based in Austin, Texas. But I believe if I'm remembering correctly that when Rachel and Dave were planning to move their headquarters from LA somewhere else, they had looked pretty heavily in Nashville. I believe Dave may have revealed that one of the podcasts that he did um, before he died, obviously. He had been in Nashville previously. So Harper applies for this visionary support strategist position, which again, is very vague as to what she's actually supposed to be doing. But one thing I did find interesting in the story is that the pay was $130,000 approximately, which I would be shocked if the Hollis company was offering salaries that high. I could be wrong, but you know, usually in these types of companies where there's mandatory dance parties and it's very mission driven. Sometimes I have found that people will take a lower salary to be able to work for a company like that. It's sort of a trade off because you really believe in, in what you're doing every day in theory that you're willing to not worry about salary as much. I've often wondered what people made while working for Rachel. So if you have any insight to that, let me know because I am still very curious and I would not think that, you know, she was paying people a lot of money. But then again, maybe that's why she had to get rid of all her staff because she was overpaying them or paying 
paying them so much that she couldn't keep up with making enough money to support such a large team. Because at one point, if you remember, uh, Rachel had a team of like 60 people working in Austin, which is quite a lot, especially if they had salaries in the six figures. Yeah, that's gonna be hard to maintain long-term. So in the story, the CEO of Greenhouse is a woman named Charlotte Green, who I believe is obviously based on Rachel Hollis. And this line specifically made me laugh. Charlotte was always early, except when she was late, which didn't really count because it meant that she had a really good reason or was putting out some fire or dealing with something so important it couldn't wait. That <laughs> to me sounds exactly like Rachel Hollis is, what's good for thee is not meant for me. Charlotte's style is described as Malibu meets the Magnolia Network, which again, nails Rachel Hollis, I think completely. I, I actually like laughed out loud when I read that. That's the perfect way to summarize this look right here. Charlotte's accused throughout the book of making lots of promises she doesn't follow through on, picking favorites and pinning employees against each other. She's described as, her whole thing is that she is just like you and me, except she isn't. Sounds about right. Throughout the book, Charlotte also finds herself in hot water for being fairly culturally insensitive. One example is that at work, she is just proclaiming pretty openly that she believes all Filipino people are good at karaoke. She shows up for her office Halloween party wearing a kimono. And there's a scene where she tells Harper to hire one of everything while hiring fitness trainers for some sort of product that she's launching. So again, we've sort of heard these stories on the DL and have witnessed some of Rachel's insensitivities when it comes to culture. So if this is truly a novel based on real events, then I guess that was true behind closed doors as well. So throughout the book, we get to see some of the content that is coming out from the greenhouse. And a lot of it mirrors what the Hollis company was putting out at the time. And also some things that still come out on occasion at least, including Rachel's weekly emails. In the book, they're called Seeing Green monthly newsletters. One of them includes the quote, if we're not learning and growing, we're dying. Which of course, that is one of the famous lines that Rachel and Dave Hollis used to repeat over and over on their Rise Together podcast about couples, that if you are not growing together as a couple, you are dying together. I find that to be extremely toxic advice, obviously. We also get to read an email campaign called Love Charlotte, which I believe once again is like Rachel's weekly emails. So it turns out in the book that Harper is the one who actually writes those emails for Charlotte, even though Charlotte proclaims publicly that she is the one who writes those from the heart. And I find this to be an interesting, I don't know if accusation is too strong of a word, but if it was an accusation that Rachel is not even writing her own content, I mean, it's not surprising at this point, to be honest, because I don't believe anything she says. And I think most of the things she claims are not true, but her big claim to fame is that she had time to write a book in the morning while her children were sleeping. And that is what every woman should do. If they really believe in their dreams, they should get up early and bootstrap themselves. Most people won't get up at 4 a.m. If she has other people writing for her, then the myth that if she can do it, anyone can do it is really DOA. <laughs> One line that made me laugh was this. Listen, sis, you know how relatable I am. <laughs> I want to be relatable. Other phrases used in these letters are choose success and failure is a choice. And this one, we can, so we must do better, be better, try harder, care more. <gasps> then we're introduced to a character named Ryan, who I believe is based on Dave Hollis. And we also meet a character named Aaron, who I believe is based on Rachel's videographer, Jack. Jack, Jack, Jack. This is the final one, Jack. Ryan is described as six foot five and smokes a vape. His character mostly stays home with the kids and he used to work at Greenhouse, but now is trying to launch his own venture called Mr. Class, which is a play on master class. And it's specifically for men, I guess. In one scene, Ryan, who is drunk, causes a scene at a bar and says that Charlotte is only in the position she's in because of the money that he helped provide in the beginning of her career. And as we know, that is sort of the inferred fights that Rachel and Dave have had at some point behind closed doors because they've both publicly kind of said that at certain points. Throughout the book, Charlotte and Ryan's relationship is described as tumultuous. They have several fights throughout the book. They are pretty passive aggressive to each other. And instead of Rachel and Dave's four children, Charlotte and Ryan share six children and Ryan actually has a child with his ex-wife. Charlotte and Ryan share two twin boys named Willow and Wyatt, a 10-year-old girl named Maddie, an eight-year-old Henry, and a six-year-old Jagger. 
murder. And also in the story, Ryan has an ex-wife and a child with that ex-wife who is now a teenager. It doesn't come up a lot, but it was a detail in the story. And his name is Jameson. Charlotte likes to call herself a mogul mom. And it's noted that the children are very comfortable being in front of the camera and being posted on social media. In one line, Charlotte says, I don't want to be a mom to them. I want to be an inspiration. And I think that very well sums up what I believe that Rachel Hollis believes about motherhood. I don't think Rachel has ever really quite enjoyed the ins and outs of, of being a mom. I think she likes the status that being a mom provides, especially in the self-help space. But I think that line really resonated with me a lot that, yeah, that sounds like something Rachel Hollis would say, maybe not out loud, but she would say in her head. We also meet Oliver, who is a close confidant and friend of Charlotte, who also works for Greenhouse. I think Oliver is based on Sammy because Oliver is gay and married and they are close friends outside of work, but there is that working relationship. So I think it's based on either both of these people into one character or just based on Sammy. We get some basic info about growth planners from the greenhouse, which I think are the same as start today planners. We also hear about the company's women's empowerment conferences that they call Inspire. I think that's obvious that that would be the Rise Conference. When describing the greenhouse offices, Harper points out that there's a big neon sign that says success never sleeps, which I think is exactly perfect for a character like Rachel Hollis because most people won't get up at 4 a.m. I found this part really interesting and I do wonder if this was a rule at the Hollis company because if so, it is insane. <laughs> but at Greenhouse, you were not allowed to have any personal belongings on your desk, like not a photo, not a tchotchke, nothing. And you weren't allowed to have food or drinks in the office. Seems a little weird, but you know, I don't know. Seems a little extreme, especially for a place that's supposed to be all about loving life and finding joy. I would like to have a Diet Coke uh, while I'm working at the office. <laughs> that would bring me joy. Part of the daily routine of employees at the greenhouse, they had to read positive testimonials and comments from super fans to Charlotte. And most of the time, those comments were directly related to Charlotte and sort of spoke about her as this larger than life guru figure. One example being Charlotte Green is my hero, a teacher, inspiration, and friend all in one. <laughs> Sounds like a toxic parasocial relationship to me. Oh no, it's okay, I don't get sick. Then we're introduced to a character named CJ, and I really racked my brain about who this could be, and I'm not sure. I don't know if Rachel had any big competition in the self-help space. CJ and Charlotte tend to have this like competition that they're trying to be the number one boss babe in the world, and I just don't know who that would be in real life, at least back then. Some of my thoughts were Jenna Kutcher, Mel Robbins, I mean, Tony Robbins at one point. I know Rachel's like a big fangirl of him now, but at one point she was sort of trying to compete with him. But I don't know. I think maybe it's not one person that CJ represents. I think that character may be based on like the haters because CJ within the book kind of calls Charlotte out on her BS, including plagiarizing and being inauthentic. So I don't know of any one person ever did that to Rachel. So I'm just gonna assume this was sort of like a character that encompassed anyone who wasn't worshiping Charlotte at the time. Thank you for supporting me. And if you don't, suck my dick. Another one of my thoughts was that maybe it was Marie Kondo. I don't know. Marie Kondo doesn't seem like the type that would like launch a campaign or care any about Rachel Hollis in any way. She seems to be doing her own thing, but almost every one of the self-help gurus at some point that I've covered has had an issue with Marie Kondo or has had some sort of jealousy and maybe that's because she actually gives practical advice, <laughs> which is something that these other gurus can't seem to do. But who knows, that's just a guess. So I'm gonna assume that CJ is based on no one in particular. But if you think I'm overlooking something, please let me know in the comments below. Okay, so here's where some of the more wink wink accusations are gonna start coming in. It seems to be A-OK -okay with Charlotte to borrow some ideas and pass them off as her own from merch to chapters in her book to basically anything she thinks of if Charlotte finds it to be good. She doesn't have a problem with taking it and giving it out to her followers with maybe changing a word or two. And that's definitely something that Rachel has been accused of many, many times throughout her career. And whenever Charlotte receives basically any criticism, she chalks it up to, 
well, if I was a man, no one would be criticizing me for this. And yeah, that's also something that Rachel has uh, really done through her career as well. Brought that up when she's been criticized. Like, well, no one criticizes Dave for getting divorced. And it's like, that's not true. No one's criticizing Tony Robbins for stealing content. It's like, that's not true either. <laughs> but also I feel like uh, even if that is true and people are just misogynistic and sexist against her, do you still want to be doing those things? Someone who represents women on a large platform, you want to be okay with cheating and stealing because men do it? That just seems wrong to me. Unlike Rachel Hollis, Charlotte goes to college and she says that she told the public that she worked two jobs to be able to pay for her tuition. But in reality, her parents took out a second mortgage to be able to afford the tuition for her to go to college. I wonder that also because Rachel moved to LA when she was like 17 years old and says she had no support, no financial support at all from her parents. Why the fuck you lying? And I just find that to be a little unlikely. I feel like her parents may have helped her a little bit to get started, you know, with some funds. But as Charlotte says in the book, doesn't mean I didn't still work two jobs, but it does make the story less interesting to say I also got a little help. And I think that's probably true with all these gurus. You know, they probably did do a lot of the things they say they did while also getting financial support from somewhere or getting a leg up or getting, you know, a connection or two along the way that they're not gonna mention that would make all the difference in someone else's life so that they seem like an authority who's done something unique and they are you know, able to teach you how to do it. Instead of Rachel not giving credit to Maya Angelou, Charlotte does not give credit to Mother Teresa. And I think the writing in this book does a really good job showing how innocently and slowly some of these manipulation tactics begin and kind of covertly start really positively in people's lives. For for example, Harper talks about a mandatory employee questionnaire she has to fill out when she first starts working at Greenhouse. Within that questionnaire, she is asked to, in detail, talk about all of her insecurities, both personally and professionally. That is something that I have found to be true in the self-help space. There is a lot of bear your soul and tell us all of your insecurities. And there's nothing wrong with talking about true things that have happened to you. And I used to be a big advocate of this, like, why am I gonna be ashamed of myself? I'm gonna tell everyone everything. But I then found out that that material that you give up about yourself and insecurities will be used against you to get you to buy courses and to get you to buy a growth planner. And that is the risk that you're taking by sharing intimate details about your life with people you cannot trust and people who have interest to sell you stuff throughout your lifetime. And that's the difference. And in the case of the book, Harper is an employee of Greenhouse and there's incentive for Charlotte, who is the boss at Greenhouse, to be able to manipulate her employees to work more hours with less pay, to go above and beyond for her, to help get Charlotte to a higher position of power while not compensating correctly. That's where the manipulation, I think, in the book comes from. Charlotte also suggested in meetings that the loved ones of employees may be too small-minded to understand the complex and important work they were doing at Greenhouse and suggested tuning them out to focus on work despite the long hours and lack of appreciation. There was also talk about mandatory fun time, especially on the weekends that were unpaid where wink, wink, you better show up or else. I'm not sure if that went on at the Hollis company. I have no way to tell, but that does seem like it would be in line with we choose joy at all times. <laughs> that type of rhetoric seems to, to match. And I think Noelle did a great job of showing us what toxic positivity looks like in real time as opposed to explaining it as like a definition, like what is toxic positivity? In this book, it is displayed as it really happens in real life. Like how do you get people to work for you and care about you when you don't pay them or care about them really? You isolate them from their loved ones who may put thoughts in their head that they can find a better opportunity and you make them really vulnerable by bringing up their insecurities if they start to question your leadership or authority. I'm not saying it's abuse, but I think it's definitely a way to control people for sure. And I really liked the way that it was displayed in this book. I also think Under the Influence really did describe and show, again, without going overtly and telling us what the formula was, showing us what Rachel Hollis's formula and many of these self-help gurus formulas are to get people to buy 
buy stuff. It seems like every piece of content that is shown in this book and used as an example, starts off with a story that Charlotte tells about her own life, her own personal anecdote. Then it's followed by a part where that story now becomes a part of the larger human experience. So it might start off like this. I was just at the hair salon the other day and I was talking to my stylist about cutting off my dead ends. And I said, what are dead ends? I just want to keep going forward. But sometimes I felt like I had to cut off the dead ends to be able to have better growth. I don't know. <laughs> that sounds like something that some guru would say at some point, right? Then the second part would be like, when's the last time you went to get your hair cut? And I don't mean physically, metaphorically. We all have times like this when we really need to go down a different road and take a different path, blah, blah, blah. And then the third part and the most nefarious part is that's why I created gratitude journals so that you could write down all of your dreams and goals and blah, blah, blah. So part one is story about her life. Part two is it's also about your life too. Part three, I have the solution to fix the problem that I just proposed in the story. That is the formula and it's shown throughout the book. And I think it does a really good job again of showing not telling that this is the clear cut way that you become manipulated. One line that I think was included that sums it up pretty well is you gave her something personal and she made it universal. So in the book, Charlotte eventually starts to receive some negative backlash from the haters, of course. One particularly insightful quote I thought was, I can tell you that the only thing she really has in common with her followers is that they both worship her. Ouch, yes, oh my God, that is such a, oh God, that is Rachel Hollis again in a nutshell. So by the end of the book, Harper thankfully starts to see that the utopia girl boss heaven that she thought she was living in is actually a capitalistic hell. The fun activities weren't about boosting morale, but about creating a distraction from the ridiculous amount of work people were expected to do with gift certificates and prizes handed out as a poor substitute for the lack of overtime and benefits they would be entitled to at other companies. Damn! She's seeing the light now. This part, I also don't know if it reflects Hollis company and I would, would be surprised if it did, but who knows? When Harper decides to quit her job at Greenhouse because she didn't make it for a full year, she is required to pay back her wages. Wait, what? Now Charlotte's gonna let her off the hook there as long as she signs an NDA. But I have never heard of a company other than the news industry, which is a totally different thing that we should talk about at some point in the future, where if you work work your amount of hours, but because you signed a contract, because you haven't made it to the end of your contract, you have to pay back your wages that you worked? Like what, how is that even legal? I don't know, but I would be very surprised if that was part of the Hollis company work contracts, but you, again, you never know. And like I said, the NDAs, that is something that we know that Hollis company employees, according to the New York Times, had to sign after leaving, I, I'm assuming to receive their severance. That's what happened to me one time when I worked at a startup, I had to sign an NDA before I got my one week severance. Ooh, so exciting, but you know, money is money, rent is rent, am I right? You gotta do what you gotta do, I suppose. So after Harper leaves Greenhouse, she goes to her parents' inn that they own in Poughkeepsie, New York, and she uses some of the positive skills that Charlotte has taught her to launch her parents' inn on social media and tries to gain them some marketing followers to get people to come in and stay there. Working with Charlotte had taught her to turn inspiration into innovation, tackle new challenges, pivot when needed, market products, and engage with her audience. And that's one thing I will give Rachel is credit for. I think she does have those skills. Now, whether those skills have stood up against the test of time, I don't think they have. I do think, however, though, she has some expertise in those areas. She's made an entire career out of nothing about talking about her own life stories. And hey, you know, if you can make a million dollars out of talking about yourself, you're doing something right. And after Charlotte's big meltdown and kind of getting some, like I said, the negative backlash, she starts a rise from the ashes tour, which basically Rachel's on right now. She apologized and monetized in equal measure to pave the way for her comeback story. And that's in a nutshell, the book. I left out a lot of parts, like I said at the beginning, because if you want to read it, you will still have a lot to learn and a lot to enjoy. So I did not spoil the entire book for you, I don't think. So I didn't want to get too distracted about, like I said, all of the different stories going on with characters. I think the important part was how much of this book is based on real events. So overall, I like this book. 
I mean, it's all right. Like now, would I pick it up at Barnes and Noble and go, oh my gosh, I have to buy this? No. Would I recommend it to a friend who doesn't understand or care about Hollisville? No. It was a quick read. It was an easy read. It was interesting. But if I didn't know the subtext that this was most likely based on some version of a Rachel Hollis story, I don't think I would ever read it again or or think it was worth reading. To be honest, I'm sorry. It just, in my opinion, wasn't that great. And I also think that there was a theme in the book and I wonder how much Noelle really identifies with this, but Harper sort of idolizes Charlotte because she sees herself as a Charlotte in the making. And based on some of the promotion of this book and just kind of looking at Noelle's Instagram and her life as an influencer, I feel like she wants to be Rachel or a version of Rachel, but maybe with a little bit more compassion. But then again, once someone gets into power, they can change their personality they can start acting this, you know, crazy way that I think Rachel eventually started acting like. I don't think she was like that from the beginning where her ego was so big that she can't even, you know, be in a room with anybody anymore. I think this is why Rachel Hollis is such an enigma because even though I don't like her, I don't agree with anything that she stands for, I find myself making videos about her. Noelle, you know, is launching her writing career based on Rachel Hollis. I feel like even though I can criticize and she can criticize, there's something about Rachel that makes her engaging to audiences, whether it's to hate on her, to worship her. There's something about her, honestly, her tenacity in a nice way and her obsession with herself and continuing on this path of being a mogul despite all the odds. I mean, again, it's been years since Rachel Hollis has been on top. She claims to be doing well, but other than monetarily, I just don't see her being well-liked universally. I think a lot of people watch her to watch her downfall. But hey, I mean, all press is good press, I guess. But I think that is important to point out here is that I'm not sure that Noelle's literary career is gonna take off because this book was so well written. I think it may be a success because she used Rachel Hollis and she identified that Rachel Hollis's story and her personality is something that people just cannot stop consuming, including myself. And that is a smart business move, but she, like myself, are riding Rachel's coattails, whether we want to admit it or not. There's a part of me that's like embarrassed that that's true, but I'm just criticizing her. Rachel at least is coming up with unique content. Well, I don't know if she's coming up with it, but I think it's Rachel's lack of awareness. And I don't mean that she's not aware, but it's her lack of acknowledgement, I guess, in that, you know, she's made so many mistakes. She continues to make mistakes all the time, yet she's still here. She's still trying. There is something very odd about that. It's a against all of our human conditions, I think, to be caught in so many lies and just keep going down the path because you wanna be on the top of the mountain, as she would say. I think that's why I'm invested at least. Here's one paragraph from the book that I think really put this thought in perspective. Everyone wants to know everything about her and her life behind the scenes, but if she shows us something that we don't expect, we say it's too much. We all want her to be our inspiration, not a person with flaws, but we also expect her to be just a regular person like we are. And maybe Maybe that says more about us than it does about Charlotte. And I think at this point, the jig is up and everyone knows that Rachel lies all the time and no one expects her to be perfect. I don't think anyone expected her to be perfect in the first place, but at the end of the day, if she was truthful at this point about herself, she would no longer be qualified to give anyone actual life advice. And giving life advice is her moneymaker. So even though I think most people can see through the facade that this is just a random person ranting and raving on a podcast, if she were to admit it herself, Self, then even the people who are diehard followers may leave too. And I think that's what she's trying to prevent. Let's talk about some of the drama surrounding the launch of this book. So after the New York Times article came out, Noelle pre-launched and pre-sold My Life with the Mogul, but then went radio silent for many, many months. I'm assuming once again, that maybe something legally had happened during this time period because she hasn't said anything publicly. She hasn't really explained why she changed the name and why she backed off of calling it a radio Rachel Hollis story. Apparently all the people who prepaid for the book that never came through were promised a free copy of this book. But as far as I can tell, that never happened and she never gave an explanation as to what those people should do. And you know, they were promised this as a sorry for waiting all those months after prepaying. It seems a little messy. It seems a little Rachel Hollis of her to be caught in a scandal of this kind. It's not a huge deal, but it's enough to kind of rub people the wrong way. And something I've 
accuse Rachel, a lot of people accuse Rachel of, it's like, be transparent, be open about what you're doing. If it's wrong, at least be honest about it so people know where you are and people know what they can do. Like if you've taken money from somebody, the silence and the lack of acknowledgement is kind of the worst part sometimes with these celebrity influencer scandals. So I wish Noelle would have been a little bit more open, but I will give her the benefit of the doubt that it could be a legal issue and she's not allowed to, but like give us something girl, like come on, please. <laughs> like tell us more, tell us sorry, wink, wink, give us some sort of like, I'm in legal trouble because of this, I can't go into it. I don't know, I just felt like she kind of got the money for the pre-launch from people who really wanted and supported this book and then left everyone in the dark. Sort of messy, sort of messy in my opinion. I'm curious to see if Noelle Crooks continues her career past Under the Influence. I'm not 100% convinced that this is like a best-selling fiction writer in the making. You never know, but you know, I think again, like I'm not chomping at the bit to read another one of her books, unless of course it involves the Hollis company, then I will be consuming it. But I have my doubts that other subjects will be as interesting to readers given the writing style. Speaking of interest in subjects, if you're interested in exploring the subjects of self-help, toxic positivity, hustle culture, influencers, spirituality, cults, whatever, in a snarky way, of course, subscribe to my channel. And if you want to support me even more, join the membership of the channel. That way you get really cool emotes, you get a cool badge when you comment on videos and you join a part of a community. Oh, okay, cults. And you can be better indoctrinated by me in a smaller group setting. If you just cannot get enough Hollisville content, I have made an entire playlist, which you can now click on the video on the screen. If you're watching from your TV or on your desktop, you can click on the playlist and watch hours and hours and hours of content about stuff like this delivered by yours truly. So enjoy and I'll see you next time. See ya.